Dennis Sarfate making his first appearance. What will you do to defend the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Welcome to the Green Dragon Tavern, where we talk a little treason. I'm Zach Lautenschlager. Dennis Sarfate is not joining us today. Uh, but uh, Samuel Say, one of our regular contributors, is joining. Samuel, thanks for jumping on. We appreciate it. It's an honor, as always. So we are continuing our series on the Second Amendment to start the new year. Um, it's a very important topic for discussion, and it's one that sometimes seems like, I don't know, where does it fit into Christianity? Uh, what is the biblical requirement regarding the use of force, regarding this, uh, the right to self-defense, and regarding the American uh, perspective on the Second Amendment. I really look forward to talking with, uh, with you, Samuel, about these topics because you bring a unique perspective and one that uh, I think uh, we benefit from. So you uh, are obviously born in Ghana and uh, grew up in Canada and then immigrated to the States uh, several years ago. Um, I, I think the place to start is just to ask what... What is your perspective on uh, the use of force and on self-defense? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because just as self-defense in general, I <clears throat> I grew up really loving um, just knowing, just using physical skills uh, to defend yourself. So um, I, I was a wrestler uh, growing up, and one of the reasons why I loved it it taught me how to defend myself. It taught me not just by using strength or whatever it is as I thought it would be uh, growing up, but it really, for me, again, outside of the competitive nature of it, just learning how to take care of myself um, was very, very helpful, especially because I was growing up in a in a pretty dangerous neighborhood and it was important for me to know how to defend myself. Um, and look, as a, as a husband now, you and I had a you know, brief talk about this, I think, yesterday. As a husband, I have a duty to protect my family. So I'm looking at every um every uh possibility that i can do that it is on me right i'm the father i'm the husband so i it, you know god has given me uh my family as a steward for me to, to you know, provide for them and to protect them so whatever means i need to use to protect my family it is an absolutely godly thing it, you know when i when 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 i um when i face god i will give an account to how i protect my family um, and um, obviously, Second Amendment is a very helpful, um, uh, it, it's a great right that Americans have. Uh, and obviously, being from Ghana, being from, being from Canada, we didn't, we didn't have that right. So for me, self-defense, again, just on an individual basis, just knowing how to defend yourself whatever, in any capacity, whether it is through MMA, wrestling, grappling, whatever it is, and especially through guns, um, is something that Christians should really um, should really because uh, it, it, it's it's been amazing to me just seeing how many Christians really are against this thing, which me, really means that so many Christians I think have grown up in uh, the word privilege has been overused a lot lately. But um, I've grown up in environments where I know the how important it is to have um, self defense, especially of course uh, you know guns. And again, in Ghana and Canada we didn't have that, so being in the U.S. now, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have. Um, at least for now, anyways, I hope I hope that wouldn't change. But to have the ability to be able to go purchase a gun to protect my family, yeah, that's I think that's really the discussion that it comes down to, right? We we have to look at it and say, okay, what is not only what is your responsibility as a Christian, which which we are talking about now, but then what is the way that we would um, that we would effectually apply that if if your attacker has a firearm or is bigger or stronger or many other situations uh, too far away and is yet able to, to harm you, um, then how, how do you take care of yourself? How do you take care of your family, right? Um, yeah, but I yeah. think that one of the things that's really important for people to talk about, to think about, to consider is asking the question, what is our responsibility before God, right? This is something that is part and parcel of, of Christian thought. Um, it certainly has worked its way throughout Western jurisprudence, but it's not something that only exists there. It's something that existed in ancient Israel. You can look at the way Christianity affected um, Ethiopian culture, for example, which um, had, a, had influence from the God of the Bible even before Christ came because of Moses. Um, and 
so uh, you see this unique perspective that says the life of the individual is worth defending. It is worth protecting. We should take care of the individual. And um, I think that that's something that uh, sometimes people in America lose sight of. And there certainly are many Christians in America who hold uh, the opposite perspective and are unfortunately influenced by, in many cases, sincere held beliefs that defending one's life is somehow illegitimate, is somehow wrong. What is your perspective? What's your response to people who would say either the Anabaptist perspective, the pacifist perspective that says it would be wrong to defend yourself, or the kind of the modern liberal perspective that says, well, it's just not nice? Yeah, well, there, there are many um, answers to that. One is, you know, a lot of Christians, I think, have the wrong view of persecution. That's one of the things that I've seen a lot, even as a Baptist, I've seen a lot of my Baptist friends, not the Anabaptists, but the Baptists, uh, again, the, at least the Canadian ones anyways. In the U.S., maybe it's a bit different. Huh? But a lot of people that I, that I know, <laughs> people that I know um, have this view that even as Christians, we are to, you know, if people are coming to harm us, we can't defend ourselves, right? There's a difference between, um, you know, the government, um, the government or others persecuting us, and we have no ability to to uh, to defend ourselves, right? And we when we we make sure, of course, that even in defending ourselves, we do so in a godly way. But the example that I would give is this: if if there there are some jihadists that want to come to, into my home to harm my wife and my children because of our Christian faith. It doesn't matter what their reasons are. If I simply say, well, it's persecution, I can't defend my family, I, that is a great, that is a horrible sin on my part. I have a duty to protect my family no matter what it is. So this view that, that again, not, not even just my, my, my family, my church members, anywhere, if I can defend myself for anybody, I should. So we have a very wrong, and again, church history is even full of this, right? Christians didn't always just accept persecution. Oftentimes they were persecuted because they didn't have the power or the right to defend themselves. Not the same thing as choosing to not defend themselves. So, um, uh, so for example, right now, I mean, Nigeria, I'm sure you know about what happened in Nigeria. Um, I think it was on Christmas Day where yeah. the, the um, uh, Boko Haram, that's because, again, they're defenseless. They have no means of defending themselves. If they could, they would. I know that because <laughs> I'm from West Africa. I know that people, of course, want to defend themselves, but they're not able to because they don't have the right to uh, bear arms or the ability to even uh, to even purchase these guns. So that would be my first uh, my first argument there. But I think even you know um, being a a student of history, and especially you know when it comes to um, a lot of the liberal uh, arguments against. Uh, owning guns. Well, that goes against, I mean, for example, there is, and so amongst the, the civil rights movement, you have, well, this is, he's a precursor to, so, to the civil rights movement, but you have W.E. Dubois, who nobody would call a conservative. He was a raging leftist. He was a socialist, a communist. And after the Atlanta race riots in the early 20th century, um, he said this, this is what he, this is what he wrote. Uh, he said, this is, again, this is uh, the race riots I think 25 black people were murdered and hundreds more were injured. And afterward, this is what he said. I bought a Winchester double-barreled shotgun and two dozen rounds of shells filled with buckshot. If a white mob had stepped on the campus where I lived, I would, without hesitation, have sprayed their guts over the grass. This is, again, W.E. Dubois, who is well-known for being a communist, Marxist, he was not a conservative by any means, and yet he understood at a time in America when black people were being truly discriminated against, where you had race riots in basically every corner of American society. When, when that happened, they understood that they, they relied on the Second Amendment, their rights, including, by the way, Martin Luther King Jr., who infamously actually um, uh, applied for a gun license, and he was rejected. Right now, he still had a gun in his basement, but he now did not have, you know, the right as opposed to carry it. And he, of course, we know what happened to him, um, you know, years later. Uh, twelve, I think, I think it was twelve years after he applied for the 
uh, the gun license, and that's when he ended up being killed. But the civil rights movement, I mean, you could even go to more radical ones, of course, the Black Power, the Black Panther movement, they all understood at a time when black Americans were being discriminated against, were being oppressed, where, where the KKK would come into their homes, come to a neighborhood and harm them, they understood that the most important rights they had at that time was the Second Amendment. Yep. Yeah, the, it, it is a fairly self-evident um, reality that you have to defend yourself if you want to continue living on Earth sometimes, that sometimes it's necessary. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think that we, we have a uniquely pampered perspective in America, and we do on many topics, and the yeah. modern liberal perspective the leftist or humanist perspective that just says it's not nice. We shouldn't, no one should, no one should be able, should have uh, any implement that's capable of killing that many people. We should just make that yeah. illegal. It is one of the silliest, stupidest arguments that is patently <laughs> absurd to anyone who has any kind of life experience outside the pampered reality yeah. that we enjoy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually have more respect for the Anabaptist or pacifist perspective that says we believe as a matter of principle that it is wrong to harm another person, even in self-defense. Um, now, I believe that is a, an evil perspective. Ultimately, not that the people who believe it are evil, far from it. I have, I have many yeah. friends who, who would hold that perspective, some of whom I have, have left this earth and, <laughs> if we believe in credible profession, are now in heaven. Um, <laughs> but I believe that the result is evil, and it's evil not because I don't yeah. like it, it's evil because it contradicts biblical commands. Um, yeah. We forget that we are commanded to provide for them for not a, for our family specifically our relatives but also the members of our household and that the failure to do yep. so is worse than denying the faith point blank yep. Yep. it's first timothy 5 8 but if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever now, that is in the context of the discussion of taking care of widowed relatives and that yep. failure to yep. provide uh, sustenance for a widowed relative and leaving the care of that person on the church or whoever else happens to be there or allowing them to starve yep. is worse than denying Christ um, or is at least tantamount to. Um, and so, yes, I recognize that is the, that is the, um, the context, but the clear meaning of the words and completely fitting within the context is the reality that if you allow your widowed relative to be clubbed to death in her own house when you could and should have stopped it, you have failed to provide. And the same thing goes for your children, the same thing goes for your wife, the same thing goes for the other people that you could influence. Um, it is simply, it, we are ignoring what the Bible actually teaches us when we say that self-defense yeah. is wrong. Um, we are commanded not to kill in the uh, in, among the Ten Commandments. That is the let's see, that shall not murder. Is that the fifth or sixth? <laughs> I'm gonna have to go I'm through. Really better. I'm really bad at remembering that. <laughs> the numbering. Okay. Uh, yeah. But thou shalt not kill is on the top of our minds, and rightly yeah. so. And it yeah. becomes it becomes elevated to something that is not commanded. In fact, it, it contradicts. It, what it actually commands in our, you know, when we apply it to say that, well, we could yeah. never, ever do anything that would cause another person to, to die, when in reality, the case law specifically says, as applying the Ten Commandments in Leviticus, that uh, if a man is found in your house at night and you strike him so that he die, you are not guilty of bloodshed. Yeah. Well, now, wait a minute. How is that consistent with thou shalt not kill? Well, if we believe thou shalt not kill, we believe that the life of the individual is worth protecting. That's the point. Yeah. And yeah. We, we are denying the command itself when we say that, well, I couldn't possibly do anything uh, that, would, that would result in the death of, for example, someone who is trying to rape my wife or who is trying to yeah. kill my children um, exactly. or who is shooting someone in the streets. Yeah, and just to add to that, there is a reason why the Old Testament affirms the death penalty over and over and over Correct. again. Because as hard as it is for us to, to accept it in our modern thinking, at least for, us, for some of us, the reality is some injustices deserve death. That's just the reality, right? So as you've said, if somebody is coming into my home to harm my family, 
right? I have a right to defend them by killing that person. Um, you know, if if it's somebody else on the street harming somebody else too, it is my duty as a as a loving neighbor to protect them that way. And if it's necessary for me to end that person's life, right? And that is not hate. That is not injustice. That is love. That is a biblical, that, that's, what, that's what love looks like in that case. But we have this weird view in our culture. And one of the things I find so bizarre is, the, the, you have some people, obviously, you mentioned who, would, who are pacifists and would disagree. But for the most part, even, many, even most of the people who are against self-defense in, in, in this way, they, they almost overwhelmingly approve of nations defending themselves. Mm -hmm. As if we forget that nations are really just the totality of individuals in a, nation, right. in, in, in a certain location. So if Israel deserves to, if Israel has the right to defend itself, if America has the right to defend themselves, then why doesn't a husband or a mom right, uh, have the right to defend themselves too? It is a strange thinking that we have in our society. The reason why nations have military, the reason why they have weapons is because they know that in a sinful world, they may not understand it theologically the way that the Bible clearly states it, but they know there are evil people in the world who will always want to harm others. Therefore, they need the ability, they need the weapons to defend themselves or defend others. We know this, but when it comes to us as individuals, we have this, again, pampered way of thinking that it would never happen to us. Or that if it happens to us, that we will, you know, we'll, we'll find some other way to protect others right. without having to use deadly force. And that's just not reality. It really isn't. Um, and just to add to that too, you know, about the liberal argument, one of the things that I find really interesting is that liberals or leftists keep claiming that black Americans are being oppressed by the government. Well, if the government is trying to oppress me, why do I want them to take away my guns? That seems like a very bad idea. <laughs> it doesn't seem like... Yeah. Why would I want to give money to my oppressor, sorry, give um, uh, weapons to my oppressor, supposedly, so they can then keep oppressing me right. without me having the right <laughs> to defend myself? It makes absolutely no sense. If, again, if women are being oppressed in society, more than any group, shouldn't they have the right to have the great equalizer in having weapons right. to then be able to stop men from harming them? Yep. You know, and one more thing. I think, you know, being, since I'm from uh, Canada... I'm convinced one of the reasons why C Canada is significantly more authoritarian than uh, Canada is, uh, sorry, than the U.S. is one because we don't have a Second Amendment in Canada. We have no rights. Uh, that's why Trudeau right now is banning every gun uh, possible, including banning guns really th th that farmers are using to protect their own, you know, their own property. Uh, but one of the reasons why I think that Canada has become increasingly more authoritarian is because the government. The, 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 Canadians, the Canadian government does not fear the people. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., there is a healthy fear that if we do this, yeah, it might not go so, it might not go so well. It might not go well for us because citizens have uh, have weapons. Where in Canada, the vast majority of people do not have weapons or do not have the right to have weapons, and because of that, the government is increasingly becoming more totalitarian. So, for example, um, the Freedom Convoy that was really the first mass protest we had in Canada. And the reason why they were able to shut it down quickly is because, well, they have the weapons. Mm -hmm. The citizens do not, and they do not fear the consequences. I'm not suggesting that the citizens should try to overthrow the government. I'm not saying that. But the reality is they don't fear the people because the people do not have weapons. And, you know, we talked about that. I talked about that a little bit previously, and I'm glad you brought it up again because it's a very, very important point. It has to be mentioned every time, I think. Um, the reality of self-defense is just that. It is defense of, of self, and that, that does happen in, with individuals. And then individuals are responsible to do so for people who cannot, fathers, mothers for children, husbands for wives, the w stronger for the weaker. And then there is uh, the reality that people may band together to defend themselves as well. And these are all legitimate biblical uh, uses of force. Um, uh, but somehow, I think sometimes in America, on the conservative side, we tend to think that, well, we could go out and attack. Uh, we could go out and attack the bad guys, and that would be in defense. No, only in very limited... Now we're talking about just war theory. 
And there is, there, there's a clear way to do that, and we'll have a discussion on that because it is part and parcel of the discussion of self-defense. Um, but mm-hmm. when we are talking about citizens defending themselves from government action, that is a very unique situation in which, number one, the citizens have, if they're doing it correctly, spent years, maybe decades, petitioning for redress of grievances and asking peaceably, please fix this problem. Government says no, finally, or says no, 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 for a decade, maybe. And then eventually, uh, the citizen may say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to stop doing the thing that you are saying I have to stop. Or I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to refrain from doing this thing that you say I have to do. And see what happens. Because a lot of the time, government says, well, (laughs) I guess when push comes to shove... Uh, We don't actually want to make you do that. And that's exactly what happened with all the COVID restrictions in any place where people said in America, where they said, nah, we're going to church anyway. We are, we are going to go to work. I'm going to go to the grocery store to buy food. I'm going to leave my house to do what I need to do. And that's up ultimately up to me. Nowhere in America did the government say, "Not nah, we're going to show up with guns and we're going to make you do it." They couldn't. Now yeah. there were instances. Yeah. You have individuals. You have these, you know, these things, these outliers. But it wasn't like Canada, where the police show up and grab a pastor and yeah. drag him down the street and yeah. throw him in prison. Exactly. And did it again and again. Exactly. Why not? Well, because in America we have a a long standing in the U.S. We have a long standing tradition of the people ultimately making the call and deciding. No, that's not government's job. Um, Why is that? Well, because it does go back to what you're talking about. Government in the U.S. has a very, it is deeply ingrained in in the system of thought. Everyone kind of remembers that, yeah, eventually, eventually the American people did shoot back. And that's the point, right? That's the point. Yeah. Let's say you say, no, I'm not going to do the thing that you say I have to do ultimately, and the government does send uh, a military force to make you do it, and it is unjust, Um, that is where defense starts to become an option. Now, again, it has to be specifically done. It must be led by people who have authority to to do so, Um, and it must be done in a way that has some hope of success. Otherwise, you just mean it's just a massacre. Um, yeah. But this is, we're talking about the American War for Independence. We're talking about what happened in Lexington and Concord. Um, this year will be the 249th anniversary, uh, April 18th and 19th of 2024, of uh, just exactly this. And everything I just laid out, everything from decades of, of petition to uh, refusal to take uh, the initiative, refusal to be, go, on the, uh, go on the offensive, a, the defensive posture that says, Look, as long as you are willing to to not shoot, we're, we're, everything's good, ultimately. Um, but eventually, yes, people have to say, n- no, ultimately, there are issues that are worth defending, and we will defend ourselves. Yes. So I think that, yeah. that, you know, that ci- in that civil sphere, you're absolutely right. I want to go back and talk a little bit about the, you know, the, the individual self-defense or self-defense against crime or violence that is not government-sponsored. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. In the United States, we do have a long um, subculture, uh, which is fairly strong, of what I would call pacifist or anabaptistic thought. Um, there are many all the way from the Amish to the Hutterites to um, several other smaller branches. I believe the Moravians had a similar perspective. Um, and these, uh, you know, we remember uh, um, Amish today as people who live among us and consider themselves to be somewhat separate. Um, they were here since the early 1700s, and in fact, um, there, is, there was a settlement in eastern Pennsylvania, in North Kill, on North Kill Creek, uh, ironically named, that eventually became the site of a massacre, and it was the Hochstetler mass- Massacre. Mm-hmm. Um, these people were, uh, they were German Amish, most of them from, actually from the cantons in Switzerland, and eventually they were wiped out while they sat there and watched the Indians do it. The, this is in the in, in 1740s, I believe it was 42, during the French and Indian War. Um, and a group of Native Americans allied with the British came down and raided, and the Amish settlers said, we're not going to defend ourselves. And they, the men stood and watched as um, this raiding band killed their children, killed their wives, and killed them. And they did so because they believed that it would be wrong to exercise self-defense. 
Um, I know this story because there was a little boy, a Hostetler, who hid in the potato bin. And I don't, we don't really know. I think it was probably underground, like a cellar. And he, he was overlooked in God's providence. They did not find him. And he crawled out afterward and was the only living Hochstetler in the United States or in wow. the colonies. Wow. And he became one of my great, 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 great grandpas. My grandma used to sit me down wow. and tell me that story. And there are Hochstetlers to this day. In fact, there are a couple in Indiana um, who have one, one of whom who served in Congress. His son now serves in the state legislature. Um, wow. And I understand we're distantly related. My grandma always said, and I, I haven't been able to verify this, but she always said that every Hostetler in the U.S. has some lineage to that little boy who hid in the potato bin. Um, now, it doesn't mean, I, I've always wondered, well, couldn't a few of them have immigrated since then? Um, but a lot of the Hostetlers, at least in the U.S., I have, I have descended from uh, that little boy. Now, there's God's providence, right? We see God's providence. Even though his mm. father failed him and did not protect him, mm. God protected him. Um, and so we do not get to overrule God's providence, but we do look at that, or I look at that, and I say, what a tragic reality that mm -hmm. our beliefs have serious consequences, and that a failure to obey the command to uh, provide for our own, for the members of our household, ha can mean terrible things, uh, and it is, a, it is a horrific reality. If we fail to do that, um, we are mm -hmm. failing the most defenseless people who were placed under our care. Um, and so it's, it's absolutely vital. It is absolutely vital that we recognize, as you have said, that it is a core responsibility to defend, uh, especially the lives of the people placed uh, under our care. And this is what, you know, this is what the, what is meant by self-defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, I think, just to add to that as well, too, I think, um, you know, it's uh, the nuclear bomb has been a big topic because of Oppenheimer. Uh, I haven't seen the movie, uh, but I know that that's, that was a discussion for some time. And one of the things that I was reading about a nuclear bomb, and it's pretty clear, is that even though it's a very powerful, powerful weapon, obviously, even though it is terrifying, it is actually a deterrent. Um, I'm convinced one of the reasons why there there haven't been much more um, mm -hmm. deadly wars over the last several decades since World War II is because of the nuclear uh, the nuclear weapons. I, it's not just me saying that. This is you know very well known kind of theory out there. I don't know. I don't know what you think about that, but uh, it's, it, it seems very compelling to me. I say that because this is a bit of a you know somewhat of a funny story, but. <laughs> now that I'm a new immigrant to the U.S., I often laugh, you know, I tell my Canadian friends that I'm very differently now that I'm here, uh, in the sense that I'm not a violent person, at least not anymore, I used to be, <laughs> but um, I'm not an angry person by any means. But when I'm driving, I make sure that I don't get angry at the other drivers, <laughs> that I, don't, I, I try to be a very good boy. When I am anything, if anyone does something to me that I don't like, I make sure that I'm a good, godly man and I react well. Part of the part of the reason why it's not just uh, because of my love for the Lord. It's because I am no longer in Canada anymore. I had friends <laughs> uh, who came from Canada, Canada as well too, and they were saying a similar thing. Because in Canada, you know that the the average person does not have a gun, so that if things escalate, you're not really too worried about it. But here, the assumption is a lot of people have guns. Mm. And it's the deterrence in a way that it makes me make sure that I'm always on my good behavior. Not that I would not be doing so in Canada, but I'm much more um, aware of that now. And I'm thinking that not just, of course, we know that people use guns to protect their families or strangers. We know that. But I think Americans might be more surprised to, to know that... The, that just be, since people have guns, it's actually much more of a deterrent to violence than they might think. I think that's an historically proved uh, proposition um, that uh, the possession of force is a deterrence. Uh, the other way of saying is that an armed society is a polite society. Um, and this is something yeah. that yeah. 
my dad's generation likes to talk about. I grew up in the mm. gun world a lot. Um, I worked obviously in gun politics for 25 years. Um, still do. And um, that is that is something that, that American gun owners subscribe to. And then I think that it, it it's it's obvious. It is obvious that if if people have guns, then we are required to um, we are required to function in a way that is respectful. And it's not just because oh my goodness I might get shot. Well, look, I've got a gun. He's got a gun, right? It, it's not like well I don't have a gun, so if I don't submit, no, that's obviously not the point. What we're talking about is that mm. everyone has the right to possess a firearm. And what does that mean? It it brings an extra cognizance, an extra awareness that. I don't want to have to start shooting, especially over something stupid. It's people who don't have anything to lose. And this is something that we also see when we all know that there is no chance we're ever going to even meet. Oh, we get really snarky with one another on Twitter, for example. When they, and as soon as there's a chance where we might actually have to look one another in the eye, uh, it, changes, it changes a bit. It's, yeah. an, it's an odd reality to fallen sinful human behavior. Um, we are all fallen. We're all sinful, but that we we do have a strong sense of yeah, that could go someplace I don't want to go, and so <laughs> let's not yeah. let's not do that. Yeah. Um, I think that there is a deep desire in all of us for uh, the reality of heaven, um, and I'm not just talking about you know the the cultural. The, what do we mean by that, right? Sometimes it pops into your head, sitting on clouds playing harps, right? Or, or being in the presence of God or singing songs forever, whatever it may be. But what I mean by that is living in a society in which no one is trying to hurt anyone else, where it's not possible to kill people, where we could just live in harmony and we could have this opportunity. Now, that often gets called utopian, and it is before the return of Christ, a false utopian idea. But that, that desire still exists in everyone's heart. Every human being, as soon as we are cog- have the cognitive ability, we are able to discern that it is, it is possible to live in peace, and we all really wish we could. I believe that that is a reality, and we have to really descend down a deep, dark, broken hole for that to go away. It's not that it can't be done. There are people who don't desire peace. Um, but most of them uh, get into a different category and in a civilized society um, become in, in, enmeshed in the criminal justice system. Most people desire that, and so one of the responses is to say, well, maybe if we just passed enough laws, we could actually make everyone live in a way that we could all enjoy that kind of uh, of, of relationship with everyone. So if we could just ever get rid of all nuclear weapons, for example, or if we could just get rid of all firearms, or if we could just get rid of all racism, we'll just ban it, or we'll, we'll do whatever we want. And that's, that's the idea. One solution to human sin is government. And that, that sums up the leftist perspective. We're going to use the power of government that, to the level that it is absolute tyranny, but we're going to use it right. We are benevolent dictators, and we're just going to make mandate that everybody be nice. Um, and it is patently absurd. The other problem with it is that it opens the door and just creates the vacuum into which someone who does not care and who only wants to wield power and be in charge and take advantage of everyone else can step into that, uh, that role and take over. It happens again and again and again and again. Um, that is what we would call Marxism. It is what we would call tyranny. It's what we would call dictatorship. Um, but now we're, there are people who want to do it to ourselves and want to make all of us do it out of, out of a professed good desire. And I actually believe some of them believe that it's possible that we could create this utopian reality. Well, you can't. You can't get rid of technology. It never goes away. Once people know that it's possible, it doesn't matter how much you get blasted back to the Stone Age. Somebody knows how to do it, and they're going to build it again. Um, if, if, you know, God forbid you did have nuclear war and, you know, you wiped out, you know, all the, the worst, the worst possible models. And we've all seen the movies from the sixties, right. Or, or movies portraying the sixties. Um, what would happen? That would not be the end of nuclear technology. <laughs> somebody, even if it all got blown up, somebody would make more because we know how to do it now. Mm-hmm. Same goes for guns. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't yeah. get rid of it. You have to deal with the reality that it's here now that that reality is here and our fallen sinfulness is going to express itself through that now and not just through fists or sticks 
or swords or bows or catapults, whatever it, whatever it may be. And so we, we have to be realistic. We have to be, let's say, scientific. We have to observe the reality and react to what, what the reality tells you actually exists. And I believe that is, that is the beauty of God's law. Uh, for those, you know, and this is, this is a discussion specifically on what is the, what does the Bible say about, and we've talked a lot about it today, what does the Bible say about defending yourself? Well, it says that mm-hmm. murder is wrong, that you may not kill, mm-hmm. and then it defines what does that word kill mean? It means do so without justification. There are numerous uh, exceptions. One of them is the state responsibility to put to death someone who has murdered, um, and under the biblical law, it requires two witnesses. And this is why the death penalty in the West is so terrible. We don't require two witnesses anymore. We don't have proper judicial process, not even close. We don't even have Western jurisprudence process. We have violated it to that extent. Um, and so I actually oppose the death penalty as long as we are not requiring two witnesses. And I don't mean two people who saw it. You have to have two independent uh, sources of evidence that um, are very clear to the level of eyewitness testimony. Um, and so, but that doesn't deny the fact there are people who want to say that, well, they look around at what's happening with the death penalty, for example, and say, this is wrong. And what we're doing in America today is wrong. Um, and they say, so we shouldn't have the death penalty. And then we have to come up with creative biblical arguments as to why the very (laughs) clear commandment that there does need to be a death penalty for certain crimes, uh, doesn't actually apply today that, well, Jesus is here, so it doesn't apply anymore. Something along that line. Well, it's, it's just silly. It's just silly. The, the, that's yeah. not what the Bible says. Let's be honest and recognize that you can't say, I'm a Christian, and therefore I, believe, I don't believe in the death penalty. Well, no, you can't say that. That's not what, that's not what the Bible says. Uh, yeah. So, uh, And I think the same goes for self-defense. Um, the same goes for um, national defense. All of these things, they get abused and they get corrupted um, but the solution isn't to, oh, just chop it off and throw it away and pretend we can all live in a utopia. You have to be able to defend yourself. That's the reality. Mm-hmm. Well, brother, thanks for your yeah. time this morning. I appreciate it. Um, we will look forward to the next conversation. Excited about everything that you're working on. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I, re- I really enjoyed it as always. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.